welcome again to those who just joined. Really encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat when you have a moment. But first, if you could join me in giving your full attention to Elder Yvonne Rigsby Jones. Yvonne is Nanemach First Nation, Coast Salish. She leads the Community Capacity Building Program as Elder. Yvonne dedicated 29 years to leading Sausen, Sauten Lilum Treatment Center, retiring in June 2015. And over her career, she developed treatment practices such as residential school trauma healing while participating in regional and national committees. She's an ambassador for Reconciliation Canada and a member of the governing council for the MSW Indigenous Trauma and Resiliency Program at the University of Toronto. Yvonne understands traditional practices and ceremony are the way home for many of our wounded people. She has listened, encouraged, challenged, and led. She believes in compassion because compassion works. Um, I'm just going to add a few other words. So, hi, Chika. So, yeah, I am Yvonne, and I'm the daughter of Nelka White Simpson, daughter of Isabel Wise White, daughter of Jenny Wise, all strong Sinaimoko women. And as I name them, I call my ancestors to me. So, they're here. And my dad was first born, first generation born in this country. His name was Dave. And my other grandparents came from England on a ship. So I'm a mixed blessing and um, grew up walking in two worlds. And, and that was okay. Challenging sometimes, but very okay. And uh, I really honor and acknowledge the uh, ancestors that have come before us, before all of us. And I, uh, I live, work and play on the land of my ancestors of Sinaimut. And it's certainly been an honor and a privilege to be included in the community capacity building and leadership program. The two groups of diverse individuals are just absolutely magnificent. Thoughtful and endearing. Uh, I just, I'm really gonna miss them. So uh, I think this world is gonna be totally in for a treat when all of these projects become reality. It's really amazing. So if we can just take a big breath right now. Creator, grandmothers and grandfathers, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to gather. And thank you for the courage of the presenters this evening. I ask you all that we be present with kind hearts. And we're gathering in harmony and supporting each other in the best way possible. Please tonight be gentle with yourself and with each other. And we'll enjoy this evening together. All my relations, hi Chika. Thank you. So um, for those who I don't know, my name is Shanti Besso, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joining you today with deep gratitude from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and specifically the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations um, in what we otherwise call East Vancouver. Um, I'm the director of a group of programs that are broadly focused on leadership and community building and lifelong learning at SFU. And I'm very proud to work with the team that's leading the Community Capacity Building Certificate or the CCB as we call it. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the convening partners, SFU Lifelong Learning and our co-conspirators at SFU Public Square. I just have a couple of important housekeeping notes. So first, closed captioning and live transcription are available for this event. So you can see the instructions there on the slide. Uh, if you click on the more at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to select the option for the Zoom closed captioning function, which is sort of an auto AI function. But you can also follow the link in the chat to a Google Doc where real and wonderful humans are transcribing um, if that's a better option for you. And with thanks to Daisy and Raven for your work this evening. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to our community guidelines. You can review them yourself here and they'll be posted in the chat as well. But very quickly, there will be no tolerance for anybody who's inciting violence. Uh, on the other hand, thoughtful questions are welcomed throughout. Please just use the chat. Please don't assume someone's gender or pronouns. 
please follow the principle of step up and step back. And please, please take care of yourselves. Uh, just two more important notes from me. The first is that I'd like to express our deep appreciation to the funder for this event, the David and Cecilia Ting Endowment for Education for Public Responsibility. That's a mouthful, but um, sincere thanks to the Ting family. And the second note is what I think is some really important grounding context, which is that SFU's president, Joy Johnson, has articulated three core priorities for us as an institution. Um, the shorthand version, very shorthand, is students, reconciliation, and equity. We have a long way to go as an institution. But there is also some really important and meaningful work happening in lots of different ways across SFU. And I may be biased, but I really believe that the CCB and the space that Elder Yvonne and the instructors, and most importantly, the learners have created together is the most beautiful enactment of all three of those core priorities altogether. And I'm so grateful and I'm so excited to learn with you all here this evening. So that's enough from me. I'm so happy to leave you in the very good hands of my dear friend and colleague, Vanessa Richards, who is one of the lead instructors and facilitators for the CCB program. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you for the invitation to be with you here tonight. My name is Vanessa Richards. I am the daughter of Adelheid Patsak, who came in the arms of her mother, Irma Noy, from Vienna, Austria to Canada when the war in Europe was starting second time around. And I'm also the daughter of Rudolf Richards, who came to this country from Trinidad and Tobago um, as a student and also carrying traditional Trinidadian drums and songs, which were a retention from the Yoruba people. I am with you right now from Mount Pleasant in the homelands, unceded, unsurrendered, unbought, and defended of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Really happy to share our work with you today. Our class always starts with Yvonne, because we want to ground it in how we might become better guests here on these territories and really um, begin to accept the invitation that's being offered all of us settlers all the time on how to get in right relation. So we begin with Yvonne and then we carry on to poetry and we begin each class with poetry as Emily Dickinson says, as a way to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. I'd like to invite you into a part of our process tonight, which is a reading of the poem Perhaps the World Ends Here by Joy Harjo, who's a poet laureate of the United States. And she is from the Muscogee Creek Nation. And she's a poet I get a lot of nourishment from. And as we read this poem, I invite you to listen with your whole body. We are inviting somatics into our class every day. We know that it's part of the healing justice movement and I invite you to make yourself comfortable and let this poem come to you. You can read it if that helps with your comprehension. You can close your eyes and let me read it to you. But I invite your whole body, especially if you're the people who say, I don't like poetry. We got one for you. Hmm. All right then. We've made a classroom, excuse me, we've made a table of our classroom. Perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It's here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies and the ghost of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor, uh, they laugh with us at our poor falling down selves, our poor falling down selves. And as we put ourselves back together again, once again at the table. This table, 
has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We've given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are here laughing and crying and eating of the last sweet bite. Consider who you gather at your kitchen table. How are you tending to the company you keep? What do you bring to the table? Dear listeners, dear viewers, I invite you a little pause to think about who's at your table and what they each bring. If you feel inclined, you can put it in the chat. It's nice to get a little bit of interactivity, but it's also private. Allow me to share these words from Laura Geisigad Cuthbert, who's the Associate Director of Leadership and Community Building and the person that invited me to participate in the creation and uh, facilitation of this course. The Community Capacity Building course was lovingly created in 2013. It ran to create opportunities, connection, and support. It was a systems change lens in local community lenders. That's funny. In local community leaders. And you know what they're lending us? Their time, their attention. Yeah, temporary. So we, we have to hold it like the precious resource it is when we get that lending. Starting last spring, there was a chance to go over the existing curriculum to update it and bring more community voices into the work. Over 20 community leaders and lenders, people who lent us their time and attention, their expertise, their care and their love, were interviewed about what could make this curriculum special, meaningful, and affirming of the work people are doing each day for survival, for progress in their communities. With their many blessings, thoughts, and intention, the course was updated. Those 20 voices turned into another 75 in the most recent run, this cohort, some of which you will be meeting tonight, all here together. And I wanna welcome all of the learners that are here from both of our cohorts, CCB in the house, so glad to be with you. Uh, show some love if you're here. Let us see your face. Let us see your love reactions or your fist pumps or whatever you got for us today. We're all here together backing people, backing up people who are defending the land, learning to love our land, learning to love the land that we're on, learning to re-embrace and remember ceremony and supporting one another to scale what we know and how to learn new things about what it means to have and to hold capacity. With so much love tonight, we honor the 20 people who worked worked, worked, worked with their community needs and who voiced their community needs to us so that we could bring forward this space. We honor those in 2013 who started the process. Thank you to all who are in the room with us now. I see some of you. We honor those who have held it. The 75 learners who showed up for six hours a week, the staff who worked behind the scenes to make this strong and possible, and the next people who will go through this court as applications are currently open. Yeah, and we know just how much your own learning you will bring and be able to bring to us and to each other. I wanna share with you six um, guiding principles, invitations, agreements that we had in our sessions. Show up. And I invite this for you today too. Um, as I look at my mother's father's watch from Vienna, I like to use this for timekeeping because it's more relaxing than digital. I'm really trying to tend to my nervous system all the time and we invite that in our class as well because that's what we're going to need to do to get through this these seasons of grief that we're in and how might we do that we have to show up for each other and we have to show up as we are and we accept that sometimes you need to just kick back put your feet in the water and listen to the self listen to the water listen to the land we invite you to show up as is as you are thank you Seth, this will be my magic sign for changing the slide. 
perfect. Thank you. Be curious. We invite all of our learners to be curious, to move towards the thing that's just beyond that which they're familiar with, but are maybe kind of close. We make space for complexity. Yes, the African mermaids as an example. Some of you may know, here's a complexity. We've thought for hundreds and thousands, well, I guess hundreds of years, maybe even thousands that, um, you know, the story of the mermaids and how the sailors all over the world would jump off their ships looking for this beautiful sound. Recently, scientists have hypothesized that in all likelihood, it was the sound of whale song resonating through the wooden ships that was so beautiful. So we make space for complexity. And we want to lift every voice. Lift every voice. We have made accommodations, um, investments, changes to, and uh, how shall we say, adjustments, trying to find the rightest way so that people can learn in ways that suit them and that they don't have to struggle to learn, but we can struggle to find more ways that people can come to the table with their full selves and not have the barriers that are typical in a lot of conventional learning um, environments. Thank you very much. We're also keen on generating praise. That's right. That's my nephew held in the hands of praise. Um, we all respond when not false praise, but ways of saying, I noticed this. I have a question about this that you've done in this way. I want to respect your choices here, all the ways that we need to generate praise because it's a nourishment when it's real and authentic and we are all held by it. So we don't want to create a classroom where it's competition and we don't want to create a world where people are afraid that their good efforts will go unnoticed. So we praise. And lastly, we care for all and we invite the care for all for the more than human and the humans in the room and finding ways that we can tend to ourselves so that we can tend to the people we wish to serve. We can build our capacity to tend to ourselves to build the capacity of those we wish to serve so that we can make the world we know is coming, the world that we're in, the world that is emerging and the world that we actually want to be abiding, that which we wanna carry with us like the Sankofa bird carrying the egg from what we want to hold on to into the future. And with that, my friends, I want to introduce to you, ah, yeah, part of our natural resources here in the CCB classroom, our natural resources are us. Yeah, and if you want to just like place your hand on your belly or your lap or some like an allowing, loving hand somewhere on your body as you welcome the, the words and experiences of Desmond Williams and Emerald Asuncion, let me tell you a little bit about them both. Desmond is a community healer and a TRE practitioner, stand-up comedian and a writer whose work is grounded in the culture, music and dancing, laughter and storytelling of his upbringing as a member of the Inc. Click Kapma and afro vincentian communities. Desmond's work explores healing practices for communities affected by white supremacy and colonialism and how to foster the care and support needed. I'm the table ready. Oh, shit and how to foster the care and support needed to explore these depths safely and effectively with others. Emerald is an activist, decolonizing artist, and an advocate for collective healing, right on time, whose work seeks to uplift her diasporic communities from the island archipelago, colonially, colonially known as the Philippines, as well as her wider community in the downtown east side Chinatown neighborhood. Emerald's work in communications has spanned sectors including retail, television, environmental conservation, urban planning, and community health, with a focus on promoting and healing justice for BIPOC communities. So that's who's going to be speaking. Now I'm going to tell you what they're doing together. So they're friends, Emerald and Desmond, and they've collaborated to create an in they've collaborated to create an artistic and healing space which serves their communities. The Emerging Social Enterprise, sorry, sorry, Mina, sorry, invites all to support healing racial divides. Sorry, sorry, Mina, sorry, is a community space with an enterprising storefront, a retail platform where local artists, creators, chefs, and BIPOC-owned businesses and their offerings are showcased. 
and it's a healing space for BIPOC communities by BIPOC healers and practitioners so that we can be celebrated and elevated in every exchange. Would you please make a warm welcome rub on your heart space for Desmond and Emerald. Sorry, sorry, Mina, sorry. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Midik, shidish. Good evening. In this present moment, we stand on stolen land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and we are here to celebrate the past, present, and future ancestors of these lands and of our home. Midish, Richterman, Inshkwash, Desmond. It's good to see you. My name is Desmond. I go by the pronouns he, him, and I'm of mixed and sentient into the Tatma First Nations and European descent. This multi hyphenate creative former purchaser in various fields, recovering emotional laborer, and seed of the community with the holistic perspective is my main homie on this trip. Thank you, Desmond, for bringing your consistency, your natural vibes, somatic healing, comedy, advocacy for those living in chronic pain, logistical brain and leaderful leadership for the guide. Apropos, the Emerald Essence Show, my pronouns are she, Shia, and I am the second generation immigrant of the Bicolano, Mastequeño, and Ilocano diaspora people from an island archipelago known as the so-called Philippines. And we, we are, are sorry, 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 we're not sorry. Coach John. Salamat namarai for witnessing and taking part in our day. Coming from our personal experiences in our respective and collective communities and born from shared experience and experiences and witnessing of all the isms at play in the community health collective we work for, we've been hard at work planning a space, an outlet, a container for safety and fluidity and cultural healing. We're placing Black, Indigenous, Filipinx, and POC healing at the top of the agenda for a collectively imagined purpose-driven future. Most often women operated, sari saris are Filipino general stores where necessities like soap, snacks, and useful items can be purchased, while being an integral contribution to the community's heart and cultural, economic, and social value. Sari Sari Mina Sari is about spreading these island vibes and authentic cultural experiences through our Healthy Living General Store, stocked with First Nations and diaspora created offerings that fill home and personal needs, functional, fashionable, both fresh, frozen, and dried foods. And as a community hub and space of unapologetic cultural healing, or me not sorry, or I'm not sorry, you know? Wulangia. An exploration through ancestral and alternative healing modality offerings, comedy, music, poetry, movement, intergeneration, intergenerational sharing, and ritual and ceremony. And though this is a vision two decades in the making in my mind and a few years in collaboration together, I know I speak for us both when I say that we are incredibly humble and grateful to have been chosen to cultivate connection during the pandemic with SSU's community capacity building cohort one the most scenic route on this purposeful and productive journey of foundational inner work, capitalism informed business skills, updates, and games through the virtual spaces we have all been container gardening together in for the last 19 weeks. For all the projects, seeds planted, collaborations growing, and mountaintop dreams, you all move toward Marami Marami Salama. That's Jen. Healing justice. According to former Healing Justice Director of Black Lives Matter, Prentice Hemphill, identifies how we can holistically respond to and intervene on generational trauma and violence, and to bring collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of oppression on our bodies, hearts, and minds. Sari Sari Mina Sari is part of an emerging social movement of healing justice that is partnership and celebration of racialized people healing from the impacts of white supremacy. And we're welcoming all to support our retail space, our virtual spaces and events post COVID, as well as our BIPOC centered healing space. By acknowledging how healing our relationships to abundance in partnership with ourselves and community 
you will only strengthen the foundation for one day authentically thriving, culturally deep, richly expressed futures of continued black and bronze excellence. And as an organization led by consciously decolonizing and unsettling turtle island born second generation immigrants, we strive to use the privileges we do bear to create and build community in the balanced flow between organic collaboration and individual authenticity. Together as a community, our members and greater circles share wisdom, resources, and relations wherever possible. Despite the many challenges of COVID, we carve time and space for engaging our nearest communities in reflection of our place, our purpose, our presence, and patience and peace going forward and have plans for broadening and nourishing more engagement with the spaces and platforms we provide for authenticity and intentional content. Now to everyone building community here with us tonight. This course, specifically the people here of CCP Cohort 1, have affirmed our awareness and proof that healing happens in community. And we seek to be a catalyst for remixing capitalism. Remix! Towards more equitable energetic exchanges, and we invite all identified allies, non POCs, pets, plants, planets, and all our relations to take part in supporting the products services, programming, and art offerings to be made available through our platforms. Self-identified Black, Indigenous, Filipinx, and other people of color who are dedicated wellness and healing practitioners, facilitators, chefs, makers, craftspeople, artists, and your artisan offerings looking for a home, we want to hear from you. Maybe we can collaborate and celebrate with each other. Energetic exchanges that we seek and support from you can also be in the form of in-time or equitable trades for professional services in accounting, business mentorship, law, or carpentry, for example. Or let us know more about you and the thing that sparks in you, high vibrational reciprocity, mutual aid, and indigenizing practices for a more equitable economy while in creation of our physical space. Just imagine how you, how your contribution will illuminate and enliven our vision to spread warm, healing island vibes throughout this little corner of Turtle Island. Marame salamat po. All, All our, our relations. relations. All right. Um, Seth, can people unmute themselves? Could we give them one, two, three as a clap? And even if you can't unmute, could they just see your hands go <laughs> as a thank you? Good work. Good work, Desmond. Good work, Emerald. We're really thrilled that you shared your thinking with us and your dreams with us. We um, are also really happy to welcome to your Thinking Minds and Opening Hearts, Yonina Curtin. Yonina is a celebrated Métis and Icelandic poet. She's a mentor. She's a BIPOC auntie at the SFU Writer's Studio, and she's a champion of peer support as a component of community healing and artistic work. Yonina's presentation will include a poem, a poem from her most recent collection, An Honest Woman, which was a finalist in the 2018 Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize. Some of that poem can, uh, some of those poems can also be heard by Patrick Otomu on the Poetry Unbound on Being, Krista Tippett podcast. Really wonderful to listen to. Uh, Yonina says she's a late blooming poet. She was 61 when she received the 2016 City of Vancouver Mayor's Art Award for an Emerging Artist in the Literary Arts category. Her life story is one of learning to care for self and community during times of transition and complexity. If you could please put your hand on your heart for Yonina Curtin. Oh, hello. Hello, everyone. It's just going to take me a second to get organized here. Um, my screen is not working, of course. Just give me one moment. There, I couldn't see what I needed to see. Oh, well, 
first, let me say uh, Desmond and Emerald, wow. If I had had your services when I began recovery 35 years ago, uh, what, how different my life would have been. And one thing I've learned being in this class is uh, all the crossovers of all the people that are in this class. There's places that we, the work we're doing crosses over. But first, let me just say that uh, my pronouns are she, her, and that I'm coming to you from what we call New West these days. Uh, it is the land of the Kakite Nation and many other Coast Salish nations, Stolo, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, they all use this land. So there's overlap. And I want to start by reading you a poem. So I am a poet and I think I do speak best through poetry. And this is actually not the poem I said I was gonna read. So this is a little change. <laughs> I just wrote this poem and it came to me, uh, it was a gift. My little niece is 17, she's Métis like me. And she is always asking me questions. And she writes me and she wrote me this uh, Virginia Woolf quote, I am rooted, but I flow. Only 17 years old, she added, I am rooted, but I flow and I grow. And I thought that was really lovely. And I have grown so much in this program. I could, if I start talking about it a lot, I might just cry. So you may have some tears. But first, the poem, which really has a lot to do with this uh, wonderful learning here. It's called Rooted. I am a story within the stories of many. I am a paradox, one thing and then another. Parts of a whole that does not know itself, Turning towards the invisible, I can see the limits of knowledge, the places where formulas dissolve into knowing that can only come when quiet and walking in the forest, where the standing ones watch and wait for us to return to ourselves for the new stories that are waiting to unfold. Here, I saw so many stories that were connections and I had this revelation to this first line, I am a story within many stories. And it amazed me how often when people were speaking about their projects, how it would overlap with something that I was doing or I could see myself doing that as well. And so what is it that I've been doing? Well, I am a writer. And as mentioned, I work with the SFU Writer Studio as the BIPOC auntie. And I'm also on the board of the Indigenous Editors Association. And I really believe in story, but I had started to lose my faith. I was really feeling discouraged when I started this class. And I've really felt renewed and revitalized and I have felt the magic of stories again. So I feel very blessed and thank you all, all of my fellow learners and my instructors, Yvonne, Shanti, everyone, thank you so much because I love what Thomas King says, the stories we tell create our world and us. So stories really do matter. And I would say also the stories we tell about other people also matter. So the stories that people tell about us matter. And that's where my work comes in. So I work with BIPOC writers largely, sometimes just indigenous writers from various nations. Uh, I also work with other BIPOC writers and BIPOC is black, indigenous and other people of color. And I work with them because as a person who was of color myself, I found when I was having my work edited, sometimes it wasn't, I just wasn't feeling like the person was getting what I was saying, or sometimes they would be offended by something that I was speaking about around racism. They would take it personally. And so I realized that we need that special place with people who understand the stories that we're trying to tell. Maybe they don't know them intimately, but they have an understanding, a common experience of being BIPOC. So we need that type of editor and that is my role. I am an editor, I work with writers, but I'm also looking to build capacity around more editors as we are with the Indigenous Editors Association. And why this matters so much? Well, it matters for so many reasons and this is just but one small example. And I will read because I'm not good at uh, remembering details like history, <clears throat> but I just finished reading Rooster Town, which I highly recommend. And it's about a Métis community on the outskirts of Winnipeg. And it was considered a place of cultural safety within the hostile white settler urban environment. It was what they called a shanty town on the edge of town. They didn't have running water. 
and it was a real community. I think of Tent City when I think of this town. And it was in Winnipeg from 1901 to 1961. I was born in 1955, just south in Winnipeg, uh, down in Portage Prairie. So just south of Winnipeg. So I was living while this was happening. And what happened was the newspapers started writing articles about Rooster Town, and they were articles that said that it, there was a lot of drinking, that there were wild parties, that people were unemployed, and it painted a picture of the place rather than the community that it was. And so with that disinformation, and we're seeing a lot of this happening now, the city was able to move this, this little town out. So they moved them out. And so if you ever go to Grant Park Plaza in Winnipeg, you're walking on Rooster Town, which I did not know when I was living there myself. So they moved them out so homes could be built and Grant Park Plaza could be put in. And I know my aunties and uncles, and I know that what this community was would have been a place of community gathering. It would have been dancing and jigging and sure, maybe a little drinking here and there, but nothing abnormal compared to what everyone does after work, have a beer perhaps if, they're, if they like to have one but also um, that they just really were not unemployed. Most of them worked. As a matter of fact, they worked very um, menial jobs often in the city. So it wasn't even true that they were unemployed. Uh, and even if they were, why, why couldn't they keep their home? Why couldn't they have running water? So this is just one story of many. So we need these stories to be out because we need to be able to tell our own stories as well. We need to be able to start dreaming and so Thomas King also said, if we can change the stories we live by, quite possibly we can change our lives. And so we would like to write some of our own stories and we would like to dream, tell the, the history of the past, but also dream some new stories for ourselves. And I want to support writers in doing that. That is what I do. So my ask is this, and this is a couple of things you can do to support indigenous and BIPOC writers. You could donate to the Indigenous Editors Association. We've been doing some fabulous work with the SFU publishing department and we are building capacity around editors. We're offering training webinars and opening um, people's ideas of, to the fact that they could become an editor. We'll offer them some training, but also as a writer, you might already be ready to do some editing. You can buy BIPOC books, look for us in the bookstore. You could share our work on social media, hold us up. You can ask your local library to carry our books and you could write reviews on places like Amazon and Goodreads. These things go very, very far as for us as writers. So back to the dreaming, there's magic. The stories we tell create our world and us. So let's leave with that thought and let's create a better world for all of us. Thank you, big witch. Thank you, Yonina. I hope many of you are taking time away from the screen to hold a collection of paper and ink marks to begin to reimagine how stories have a place in our everyday, how poetry might have a place in our everyday. And um, I wish I could tell you about every single person in this class and the stories that they've shared about the work that they're doing and the ways that they've been telling themselves new stories about what's possible in their work and what their capacity is and isn't and how the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and about our work change our capacity, including our capacity for rest, which is where poetry comes in. It's a really good accompaniment when you're doing the whew, lay back. I would like to introduce to you Deep, who is nowhere close to, um, well, I think she probably, I hope she's getting some good rest in too because this person is on fire. Deep is one of our, um, so we really made a choice to bring together, we had 688 applicants to a class that had 25 positions. And amazingly, yeah, yeah, Nancy, I saw your face. That's a lot of people, right? And I want to also thank the people who are with, who are cooking dinner while they're listening to us. So thank you for just letting us be in your life right now. But we had originally had 25 positions in that we thought we could work with, 25 people. And then when Laura and I received 40 applications, we started talking about, well, 
okay, maybe we should start looking. Well, let's wait till we get to 50 applications, we said. And the applications kept coming and it was 688 people ready to get in and think about how might we bring more capacity to ourselves and our communities. And so Laura and I had this amazing task with some support and some teams here that are also were helping us go through and think about, well, how do we make a community within this classroom? So we purposefully invited people from different generations, from different backgrounds, people who had um, professional long career experience, people who were at the beginning of their working life, people who were not working, people who are living with disabilities, seen and unseen, people who are living in tents, people who are living in many different kinds of lives. And our goal was to create something together in our Zoom room that could help us learn how to be together in our communities outside of the Zoom room. And Josh Deep is a holder of great community outside of the Zoom room. She's co-director at Solid State Community Industries and a community builder with expertise in creating workers' cooperatives, mentoring racialized youth, and promoting, promoting intergenerational knowledge sharing between youth and families and organizations. At Solid State and in community, Josh Deep's work focuses on um, fostering connections across generations and within communities and using an asset-based approach. Call that praise. Assets, what's working here? How can we build on this? Huh, how can we amplify this which is working? Josh and Deep's project will focus on opportunities to reconnect with culture, heritage, and community after experiences of racism and intolerance, particularly for South Asian youth and those impacted by intergenerational trauma in the Punjabi Sikh community. If you could please put your hand on your heart for Jashan Deep Jessa. Thank you, Vanessa, for that lovely welcome. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. I hope everyone can see that okay. Looking good. Awesome. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge and express my gratitude for being able to do this work on the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiyamu, um, Suwasan, Kakite, and Coquitlam peoples. My name is Jashandeep Jessel. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the second daughter of Harvinder Kaur Jessel and the Jinder Paul Singh Jessel. Um, and I am one of the co-founders of SA Network. SA Network stands for South Asian Healing Network, um, but it also means breathe in Punjabi. Um, the naming of our organization is an ode to the impact we want to have. Um, and yeah, everyone deserves to have a space where they can just breathe. So we aim to create that space where healing can be made possible for South Asian youth. So this is my lovely team. Um, before we get into our stories, I'd like everyone to take a saw. So that means take a breath. So myself and another one of my co-founders, um, another co-founder of SAW, Serene, you can see a picture of us there when we were younger. Um, we've been friends since kindergarten. Um, growing up as Punjabi Sikh girls, we were really aware and bothered by issues we saw in our cultural community, which included things like alcoholism, family dysfunction, and a failure to recognize mental health. It's really normalized to not talk about these problems in our culture, and that's something Serene and I um, really couldn't relate to. We were outspoken, and we always chose to speak up rather than hold things in. And very recently, our need for community healing um, led us to begin a search for a support group that would provide space for our personal healing, um, but also to address our cultural need for making sense of the substance use problem that we were seeing in our community. And nothing out there really addressed what we needed. So we saw this as an opportunity. Um, and our support for each other, we realized, was a lifeline. And it was something that other South Asian youth like ourselves might not have. Um, so it was the idea of supporting our community in the ways that we support each other that really brought SA alive. Um, and here you can see my lovely team. Um, so we have Aaron, Tyson, and Amy, who also come from similar backgrounds. 
Um, and Amy actually is also in this CCB program and we were able to capture her and bring her onto this project, which I'm very excited about. Um, so let's move on to talking about what SAW Network is. So for too long, we feel that family dysfunction, problematic alcoholism or substance use and mental health have been overlooked in our community. But especially we feel like not only in the South Asian community, especially in the Punjabi community. Um, and what we want to do at SAW Network is to normalize that healing process from these issues. We realize that lots of the issues faced by the Punjabi community stem from intergenerational trauma, which is linked to the treatment of our people in India namely the 1984 Sikh genocide, or even the unfair Indian farmers bills and the ongoing protests. So these issues have disproportionately strained and harmed the Punjabi Sikh community. And we believe that having this physical space, um, this physical community healing space um, would really help to make connections and also engage people in discourse about these issues and also in the process of healing. We recognize that many minoritized groups from South Asia have similar experiences, so that's why we named ourselves the South Asian Healing Network. We are open and we want to extend this space to people, not only people who are from Punjabi Sikh backgrounds, but also other South Asian minoritized groups who relate to these problems. So who is SA Network for? The primary focus of SA is healing, mental health, and wellness um, for South Asian youth. We want to confront the issues mentioned so far, but our topics will range and we aim to cooperatively decide among the youth members who join the peer support network um, what we'll be talking about and what types of activities we'll engage in. So how do we plan to do this? Um, we plan to do this first by getting some training. So we're getting trained on things like organizational leadership, mental health first aid, um, and trauma-informed practice. We are basically equipping ourselves with skills needed to be qualified um, peer support workers. And we're getting training from, these, from people who are professionals in these fields, like for example, in the field of counseling or in the field of substance use intervention um, or in the nonprofit field. Um, but we feel that the most important thing is that we have lived experience and that's what makes SAW special. Um, we are creating this space for us and it is made by us. And that's the special part. Our major goal is to lead the peer support meetings, um, but we also plan to host social events and activities to promote an overall goal, which is building a community, which again is like something that we did with this class and Amy and I were able to witness and be part of that process. So we hope to carry those lessons on. One important thing is um, now that you know about SAW Network, I'd like to tell you that we are also operating under another nonprofit um, who is called Solid State Community Industries. I'm also a co-director at Solid State. Um, Solid State Community Industries is a nonprofit in Surrey that provides youth like us the support that we need in order to build cooperative enterprises around our interests. Um, being part of solid state means we operate as a cooperative, which includes all of the listed um, decision making and organizing features. But the most important part is that we're part of a community at solid state. So now that I've talked about what we are, I'd like to talk about what we need. Um, so we have some specific requests. Um, maybe we need you. We are really open to having some guidance, collaboration, or getting anyone who wants to be involved, involved with this project. So if you are involved, we'd love to hear from you. I'll put our contact information on the next slide. Um, we're also looking for South Asian youth who are interested in these programs. And you can sign up using the Google form that's in our Instagram bio. And I believe it's gonna come in the chat as well. Um, so our Instagram is at Saw Network. And then another thing is we would love funding. Um, we, we need a lot of training and some of that training is expensive. Right now we're in the process of getting that training, but in the future, we also do want to be able to pay peer support workers who work under SAW um, for their precious time and involvement in this project. And to support us in a monetary way, you can donate to Solid State um, by going to the website, which is solidstate.coop. You can specifically mention SAW when you donate if you'd like to contribute to our project. Um, but that said, 
all the solid state projects are meaningful. And if you choose to donate to the broader mission of solid state or to one of our sister cohorts, we would be happy for you to do that as well. And here's some contact information. Um, there's our Instagram, which is at SAW Network. We'd love if you would follow us. Um, and then our email, info.sawnetwork at gmail.com. And my name is right there in case you need that. Um, and we would love to hear from you um, about anything, whether it's a question, a concern, an inquiry, or um, a curiosity, anything. I hope you enjoyed learning about the SAW Network. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much, Josh and Deep. Oh, did I get a, did we get a clap for Josh and Deep? And could, let's do a clap for Josh and Deep. And I think we owe one for Yonina. We owe one for Yonina as well. So let's Yonina. Thank you. And to Josh and Deep's point, you know, when she said, maybe we need you, part of, like, we think it would be a disaster if the 70, Three people from CCB all came out with separate projects, new projects. We're actually really interested in how pieces might come together, right? How is it that you could lighten your own load, share the load of somebody else's? How is it that what you're doing, could you make more space for yourself if you didn't carry a whole project, but you brought your piece of the pie to another project? So we're really interested in like, what is it that you're carrying that you wanna honor, that you wanna hone, that maybe can be a part of something else. So if you also have something like, you know what? Like, I like being an advisor. I do never wanna be on boards for the foreseeable future, but give me an advisory position, I'm down with a conversation every couple of months, something like that. And I bet some of you out there have that too. So if you find that you've got experience that you think might be useful for somebody, or you want to connect somebody to some resource person, and by resource, I, it, I mean, it could be anything you saw with Sari Sari Mina Sari, the colors on there, like maybe you have like a straight line on something that looks like the aesthetics that you saw. We don't know, but we just know that we all carry a lot and that we all have a lot and probably more than we need. So if you have something that you wanna share, any kind of resource, your natural resource being yourself, it's all welcomed here. But also we're interested in your curiosity. And we'd love to offer some questions, reflections back, suggestions, about where people might go for the resources they're looking in the chat or in the room. And we're definitely having a question and answer period coming up. So I invite you, if you've got a pen and paper by your side, or maybe you've got a phone, you could write it down so that you remember when it comes to that moment, or you can offer them now in the question and, or in the chat section there, and that we'll collate those and put them into a question and answer. Well, we'll put them into the questions. We won't answer them in events. We'll answer them when we get there. So please consider that. We'd love to hear from you and know who's in the room with us. Andrea Wheeler is in the house. Used to be pretty close around this room over here in uh, British Columbia, but has now moved to Ontario. And they're a seventh generation settler, farmer and community organizer who is exploring and facilitating a collaborative practice of decolonial land stewardship and community engagement as a form of land back. As the first woman in her family to inherit land acquired through colonial violence and dispossession, Andrea is navigating her own positionality through research and relationship building in the territories of the Ganaganagai. feel like I can say it when there's not 145 people looking at me because I heard it all in the news all through my childhood the Mohawk Nation and I've spelled it phonetically Ghana okay, I'm gonna say it phonetically that is not correct because I spelled it like the country Ghana and uh, here we go the Ghana Genagai, also more commonly known as the Mohawk for those of us that don't yet speak the language and are learning to say names properly the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wasanak people, where she currently lives. And I don't think it's okay, where she currently lives. Andrea's project presentation will consider different forms of decolonized reparations as they unfold through relationship made between land and people. 
trusting in the guidance of nature and friendship in support of intergenerational community and healing. Some of our favorite topics. Could you please put your hand on your heart and welcome Andrea Wheeler. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for the land acknowledgement. Um, the area that I'm in is unseated um, and is referred to as Nutfield Track in Treaty 57, um, but I'm in Southeast Ontario. Okay, this is my first time sharing the screen, so I can, I can do this. All right. I am in the heart-centered place that I am now because of all of the people who have opened my eyes, held my hand, shared knowledge, lifted my chin and my spirit, who spoke truth, who cleared the path for my feet to walk, and encouraged me to dance through joy and growth. Many of them were a part of the Community Capacity Building Program. I have been reflecting on a quote from Lee Maracle that was shared by my classmate, Stephen. Find freedom in the context you inherit. I'm going to share my journey towards freedom through healing and reparation. <laughs> Do I know how to change the page? Okay. There we go. I grew up on the traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, and Metis people in what is commonly called Fort McMurray, Alberta. My earliest memories are of the forest, the lakes, and the animals. And I also remember the effects of extraction on the earth, communities, and people. At a young age, I learned that there were different realities and consequences for different people and communities. I eventually made my way to the unceded West Coast, to the city commonly called Vancouver, and fell in love with the place that had always been protected by the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I found movements that I deeply connected with and a community who reflected my values. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission brought the introduction of land acknowledgments and reconciliation sentiments through colonial systems and language. As I waited for action to follow, I read, went to talks and workshops, was feeling the big emotions of guilt and shame, and then my dad passed away, and I became the fourth generation and first woman to inherit my family farm. Acknowledging that I was a beneficiary of generational wealth from stolen Indigenous land meant that my learnings now were woven into my reflections on being a future elder, ownership, grief, and the memories held in lands and places. The beginning of 2019, I was standing with water and land defenders in support of Wet'suwet'en and reflected further on how I could participate in reparations and land back. As we felt the impact of shutdown Canada and the violent state response, COVID hit. I lost my job, my lease was not extended, my aunt renting the farm was moving out, and all of a sudden the vision of the farm filled with people, plants, and animals appeared, where I would focus on repairing relationships with the people whose stories intertwine with my own family's narrative. Trusting the guidance of these visions, I went back to the land of my ancestors, where I had been told that First Nation canoes had met my family at the most of the Ganya Tara Wanene, or the St. Lawrence River, and brought us to fertile farmland. However, these stories never included the names of the nations or individuals. There was no mention of the violence and displacement that took place after, or the disconnection from and monetiz monetization of nature that led us to depleting the soil, monocropping with GMO soy, soy and seeds, and killing off indigenous plants and animals. So I went not really knowing how this was gonna happen and I started planting seeds. And I set out to build relationships of trust in my new community and I was overjoyed to meet so many people of the same mind. I allowed myself to dream and sought to understand the history and the present dynamics so that I may be a part of dreaming up a more just future. With a spiritual intent, I met my community in the way that my family had taught me in service. Seeing the effects of the overdose crisis, I reached out to a Ganaganage activist and healer, Tina Point, and we started a street health group. 
Tina introduced me to her clan mother and I met more members of the Wolf Clan who became friends and collaborators. That was our first street health team. Now we have over 25 volunteers. From my new community, I learned that I was living on land that was to be held in trust for the St. Regis Iroquois people. So we decided to move from trust, creativity and collaboration to create relationships of depth where all knowledge and contributions are celebrated. We dreamed up one dish, one spoon. These are land-backed land -back initiatives where we are free to be human by practicing Ungwe Hone Neha, the original way. Connecting with the world around us, each other and ourselves through song, dance and sharing food. Relating, educating, integrating and sustaining in adherence to Gaswenta or the original Wampum Belt Treaties so that we may leave every place better than when we came. So here's our contact info and our donation info if you'd like to support the work my community is doing and see more of what's happening there. But more importantly, I call on you, my neighbors, to find your own path to reparation. Reflect on the systems you touch, the people you relate to, the platforms you engage with, and the places you hold power. That is where you can do your work. I invite you to use the opportunity of reflecting on your power, privilege, and where you have abundance as a practice of gratitude. Our past, present, and futures are interwoven. Although we do not have the ability to go back and undo the past, we do have the choice to be in right relations with the people and descendants of those who were harmed. We can acknowledge the full history, shift the energy and the relationship with the first people and honor all things that the people who commune on this land hold sacred. Don't wait until you have enough money or time. Show up for your grieving neighbors in the only way you can. Make your offering and then listen to the answer. Be prepared for the body that you live in to be a reminder of trauma to others and for people to not be ready or welcoming of what you are offering. Then find another way. Perhaps that means supporting people already doing the work or raising voice, lifting others' voices. I encourage you to deepen your knowledge and allow new voices and language to shift your understanding. Support your body, mind, and each other in this inevitable change. Let your connection to the land deepen your understanding of why land back means so much to the people who have had a connection to this land for tens of thousands of years before you did. Three class for Andrea. Nice. And Andrea, before we pass to Mateo, thank you, that was great, I like that. Um, could you please tell me the proper pronunciation of the Mohawk Nation in their language? I can. So in the Mohawk language, K's sounds like G's, so it's Ganaganage. Ganaganage, exactly. So it is Ganaganage, 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 Ganaganage. Got it for the moment. Ganaganage. Much appreciation. Thank you so much. So we've had people from across Turtle Island and down. Yeah, we had uh, we have people from South Africa in our region. We've had people in Kuru, Peru, and we have Mateo meeting us tonight in Ecuador. So this is one of the beautiful things that has come out of the opportunity to be online in the Zoom room is to really like when we were thinking about building our community together and you know part of what happened this year in our class is that students were given learners were given a sum towards their project and the sum of 500 bucks in Canada towards a project is not insubstantial $500 in the global south is another conversation and so it's been really it was really beautiful to for not only Mateo but some of the other people who are learners in our class to really help us feel present to like how much we take for granted in the global north and to see what they're sitting with in their worlds even if their worlds have carried them to sit in this same city where we're living or where this course is originating from and um 
Yeah, it was just so much gratitude to you, Mateo, and others who came in at like completely different time zones in the middle of the night and in completely different and circumstances to, to get the internet and take care of yourself arriving every day. One of our student, one of our learners, he um, met us last week while he was at work. He did his Zoom call at work and he was 480 feet underneath the ground in a uranium mine in Saskatchewan where he was working and in class at the same time. So when I'm telling you people made commitments, they made commitments to each other, to be there with each other and for each other. And Mateo, I'm so really, I'm pleased and proud to have been part of your time thinking about this work. Mateo is an Ecuador-based social innovator with a focus on reducing the gap of opportunities in developing countries. With experience in civil society, academia, and the private sector, Mateo is a true believer that to achieve sustainable and equitable development, there must be a multi-sector collaborative approach. His project will focus on creating a more participatory and proactive society through the promotion of youth leadership. The project will be run by the Youth Education Lab. The project will be run by the Youth Education Lab, an initiative that he co-created with his community in Ecuador, and he expects it to become one of the few, one of the few social enterprises focused on youth in Ecuador. If you could please put your hand in a show of welcome to Mateo. Could you please welcome Mateo Tobar? Thank you very much, everybody. And especially for that warm welcome, uh, Vanessa. Uh, and overall to Simon Fraser University, this has been one of the best experiences so far for me. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you a story about myself, but also about a project that I'm pushing forward uh, for all of you. I'm gonna set the timer because I don't wanna stick so much uh, because I'm very passionate about what I, what I, what I believe. Uh, my name is Mateo Tovar. Who am I? I'm someone who believes that change is possible. Where I'm speaking from, I'm speaking from Quito, Ecuador, which is in the ancestral land of the Quito Cara people. And I learned land acknowledgement throughout this course, and I'm really pleased to have learned about that and to really recognize who was uh, before me in this, in, this, in this land. And what inspires me, uh, basically the power of youth and how we are, as, as ourselves, as youth, can, can really push forward uh, real changes. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about how, I'm, how I am working um, to reduce the inequality in Ecuador and how basically I was able to pass from idea to action and build a social enterprise that is called Youth Education Lab. But basically, how did I end up here? Um, in 2016, I had this amazing opportunity to be a teacher and engage with my students and learn about them and their power. Then I was able to work all over Ecuador and, uh, and work with youth in Ecuador. And I was able to realize about the inequalities that we face as a country in Ecuador. And in 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, I decided with my team, uh, with some other colleagues to launch a program that is called uh, Youth Education Lab. And basically throughout the year 2021, I decided to just uh, prototype it. And I was really inspired and built connections throughout the Simon Fraser University program of the community capacity building. So basically, what is the challenge that I'm trying to solve? Uh, in Ecuador, and I think all over the world, youth is expected to work like math. So you go to school, you go to university, and then you have to be productive and you have to uh, have a formal job and, and all of that. But the reality is that we don't have equal access to opportunities for you to explore the passion and strengthen the profiles and build networks. Imagine Ecuador where someone has to walk um, in, in some provinces almost one hour to reach a school where you don't have internet connection, uh, uh, where, where you might have only two teachers. So in reality, the, the access to opportunities is really limited. And the facts are that, for example, in Ecuador, 26% of uni students drop out within the first year of college. And it's not because they don't like it or they're not, uh, or, or they don't want to study, but it also happens because they're not passionate about their dreams, about their goals. Um, and, and that has an impact in the sense that 63% of unemployed people, for example, in Ecuador, 
uh, between, are, be, are between the years of 18 and, tw and 30 years old. So we are facing a, an environment of inequality of access to opportunities. And based upon this problem is basically why we develop our solution. And our solution is called Youth Education Lab. And it's a social enterprise that works to provide greater access to opportunities for young people in Ecuador and eventually uh, all over LATAM to support them to achieve their life goals through social innovation. So we're basically working on how can we change the, the, the system of education in which we really want to push forward um, an education that is based upon the, the goals of the people. How, we do, how do we do this? Uh, we develop human acceleration labs that, la that allow you to discover meaningful education and pathways. So it's basically changing the, the how, how, do we, how do we learn? It's first asking and based upon what, what youth wants to achieve, uh, we develop experiential learning opportunities for them, for example, to learn about art, to, for them to learn about uh, if they want to become a lawyer or, or if they want to be to, to work in topics of agriculture, we provide those experiential learning opportunities for them. And not only that, but we also build networking opportunities for them to connect with persons that think like them. And through this, we're basically trying to uh, uh, trying to solve this, this uh, system of inequality of opportunities for youth. What basically, what, what have we been doing these last four months? We developed a prototype of our, of our methodology and we were able to work with almost 70 participants in a virtual format. Those are the faces of some of, 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 the, of our participants. So we basically were able to uh, develop with them goals uh, and asking them, what do you want to achieve? And based upon those goals, we were able to um, help them uh, develop in the next steps, the, net, the next steps towards uh, their visions. And we have this amazing opportunity. For example, there were students that developed their own LinkedIn profile and starting connected with other peers. They developed also their CV. They developed projects. Uh, for example, this is one of our students that was really passionate about uh, games. So basically he developed a prototype of a mouse that he wanted to use. So it's basically about asking youth, what do you want to achieve? And then not only uh, telling, okay, follow your dreams, but actually supporting them with experiential learning opportunities and with networking through um, feasible programs. And basically Youth Education Lab is this person that is gonna help you reach those, those visions. And it is one of the one of our our works, our activities that we did, where we asked youth uh, to to establish their vision and then to create a mission towards that vision. And basically, what we want to uh, for y'all to do is to basically support youth uh, in, in the achievement of those of those visions. Um, so when when. When our teachers told us that we had the opportunity to present our ideas in a, in a space of the of Simon Fraser University and uh, SFU Public Square, I, I really wanted to tell you about YEL because we are looking forward to, to build connections. And we know that there's amazing work all around the world and we want to build upon existing knowledge. So what is my call of action to you? And I see 130 people uh, right now that is hearing me and this is awesome. Uh, help me connect, help, uh, help us connect and build alliances with existing organizations for us to replicate proven methodologies and successful initiatives in Ecuador. We have the, we have the themes, we have the, the, the connections in Ecuador. We can translate processes into Spanish. So uh, we really want to work on projects without borders uh, with the support of you and also with the support of us uh, in Ecuador. And we want to build our first youth lab um, and that's why we're also looking for funding. We're looking for allies to support our work to impact youth in Ecuador. And our, for, for us, our donors are also our allies in creating positive, positive change. And those are where those, the, you can see our midterm visions that are, they are ambitious, but uh, really we see YEL as a mechanism in which we can support you to achieve their, their visions uh, towards the future. Um, so yeah, basically our ask is connect with us. This is my core team, my amazing team with whom we have been working for the last year. Um, and there's my contact information. What we are really looking forward is to build connections with all the organizations as we have been able to, 
already have experience in Ecuador. We are a, a team of passionate people. And our ask is connect with us, let's build something and let's start also a global conversation about how we can provide youth with better opportunities. And uh, if you put your phone on that, on that little dinosaur, you will be uh, connected to my LinkedIn profile. And yeah, thank you very much to Simon Fraser University for this space. And I hope that uh, we can also build um, more, more big initiatives towards the future. And thank you very much. Congratulations, Mateo. Everybody, if you'd like to unmute and offer three claps. <laughs> Beautiful. Good work, everybody. Really, really good work. Thank you for staying with us, 128 people. We appreciate that you're giving us so much of your life right now. And we're hoping that this is a rewarding and nourishing experience for you as well to see like all the possibilities, all the things that are in action, the way that the communities of learners have been supporting each other. And now we'd like to hear some questions from the floor. And I've got a couple already here. Um, Mateo, um, and then I'm gonna go to Andrea. I'll go Mateo, then Andrea. Could you tell me if you have any associations, if there are any associations um, that your program has with educational institutions in Ecuador that other organizations or educational educational spaces might be able to support or collaborate or leverage? That's the question. Yeah, so we actually were able to develop the prototype with a school with a local school here in Ecuador. And also because of the past experience that we have had, we have been able to work as our team with different uh, universities. So it's basically, um, we are starting like prototyping Yelp and we are starting this conversation. Uh, so we have been able to have access to not only schools, but also universities and all the civil society organizations that works on topics of education. So it's all about uh, developing a collaborative approach. With other, with other universities, other civil society organizations, and also a, hopefully organizations uh, all around the world. Great, thank you, Mateo. So if any of our listeners, viewers out there have uh, associations or like relationships to organizations that are doing global work or that are situated in the global south, I know many of us in the, working in the field of social innovation, social venture, we're doing work with a global approach. So, you know, let Mateo know if there's an opportunity that you might be able to share around resourcing with people power or any other kind of ways that the, the work Mateo can do can really flourish. And I thank you for that, that work, Mateo. I've got a question for you, Andrea. How is a community trust model working or whatever model she's now using for your farm? Um, they're interested in knowing whether you're giving up ownership of your family property and what that feels like and, and what you would encourage others to consider. Um, yeah, so I went with the plan of land back and asking, like focusing on building relationships and then asking what would be the best step forward. So. Um, here, though, I'm working with uh, the wolf, bear, and turtle clan, and so looking to guidance from um, their clan mothers. And so we're starting out um, with collaborating on the land in some education programs, and then we're also giving two acres of land to a group that supports new immigrants to the area to have a community garden so they can grow some of their traditional foods. And there can be some places of education and community there. Um, so my suggestion to anybody would be to go to the community and ask how they would like to approach it because um, just handing the land over, that means that then they have to pay taxes and everything that comes along with owning land and there needs to be someone available to take care of it. And the process of changing it to a land trust can take a really long time. So. Um, yeah, I think that there's ways to think of it outside of the colonial systems and just looking to their leadership. Thank you, Yo, um, Andrea. And I appreciate both Matteo and Andrea that you've answered with lean language, which gives us more opportunity to ask some other questions. We have a question here for <laughs> Desmond and Emeralds. Could you please tell us a, a little bit more about um, 
what is T R E and what are the what and are there Filipino healing arts also at the Sari Sari Minasari? All right. Well, so T R E stands for Tension and Trauma Release Exercises. Um, it's something that I've been teaching for uh, seven years now. It is a very simple series of physical exercises that uh, work to fatigue and uh, release tension from the muscles that are involved in your fight or flight response system. And what actually happens is it evokes tremors and shaking uh, in your body, which allows you to physically release tension that is built up from past fight or flight experiences that you didn't have a chance to complete. So all the times that you wanted to punch somebody in the face, but you didn't, or all the times you wanted to run out of the room when something got uncomfortable and you stuck it out, uh, that lives in your body. And so this is an opportunity to allow uh, that expression in a safe uh, and controlled fashion. So that's what TRE is. Um, it's very simple and very complex. And, uh, pass it on to Emma. Okay. Um, well, I am a community with a lot of people who practice uh, different um, embodied movements uh, from martial arts to dance to um, pilot, which is like a somatic type practice. Um, Emerald? Yes. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, Emerald, but could you come in closer to the microphone, please? Thank oh, every you. time, every time. Okay, excuse me. I don't know if you heard the beginning, but I need to start again. Let's start again. Um, yes, so I'm part of a art collective, Katara Filipino Indigenous Art Society. They've been around for about 17 years, and that's um, my main spiritually healing community um, of Filipinos who are in practice of things like um, dance and uh, ceremony and ritual and uh, martial arts and somatic healing practices, a lot. Ali, um, I miss, uh, yes, a bunch of things. But, um, so yeah, I hope to um, be a home for my art collective who has been around for 17 years and does not have a home. We just have bits and pieces of like regalia here, drums here, songs in these people's heads, you know? Um, but we're, we're becoming more organized and leveling up just as um, we, can through through the pandemic through these times so um yeah hope to bring that in with uh, everything we're doing. thank you thank you emerald and thank you for um calling the name of katara that is one of the most significant and legendary filipino uh, arts and culture warriors in the city I have, we've got maybe just a short moment before we do our closing piece, but I have two questions here, one for Yonina, and uh, somebody would like to know where, when does your mentorship start? How do I apply? And yeah, how, how, do, how do they find you? And how do they find you? <laughs> Well, that was to be part of my project was that I was supposed to get myself a proper website. So <laughs> I work with the SFU Writer's Studio. So if you were to become, uh, apply to the Writer's Studio and, and be there, I would be working available to you there. I also work at Vancouver Manuscript Intensive. So we work with people there. Um, and that's either on a full length manuscript or on a shorter project. Uh, through the Indigenous Editors Association. You can also contact me or others there. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, we are not yet ready to do this without payment. And that is one of the goals that I hope that we can get to eventually is where we can offer these these services without costing an arm and a leg. Expensive. Thank you. So, Yonina, you're saying currently you're in the development of the mentorship project still, and that in the interim, until your project is up and running on its own, you are available for contact through the SFU Writers Center. So, if people could contact you there if they uh, want to yes, talk, yes. talk and words and stories. Know what Thank they're looking you. for. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yonina. And last question for Josh and Deep. They would like to know if you're currently working out of 
like if your work is site based or are you working from the solid state um, empire? Which so, some of you may have seen featured on Holmes. What's that show called? Josh Holmes Indiana. Family Effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They built yeah. an amazing re a renovation for for uh, Solid State, and so people would like to know if they could do that work with you at Solid State, or is there another spot? Yeah, so we do intend to have our our meetings and events and activities at Solid State. Um, at this moment, we've been just meeting with our core team, but our hope is that over the summer, we'll slowly start having smaller meetings with folks um, at Solid State. So, and how will people know when you're ready, um, Josh and Deep? We are posting updates on our Instagram page, and you can also join that contact list. Um, so there's a Google form, um, and you can find that Google form in our Instagram bio. Um, so again, at SA Network, S-A-H Network. Um, yeah, and go, get onto the contact list. We will email you once there's something happening. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh and Deep, for your fortitudinal strength to bring not only your dreams through, but all of those, uh, probably what there might be like 70 young people involved in solid state. Is that about the right number? We have grown a lot. So we have like 20 something cohorts right now. So I, I don't even know what our participant count is at this moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that, Josh and Deep. So in closing, we have a kind of an exciting announcement to tell you uh, that Yonina and Andrea will share with you. So if you wanna make yourselves unmiked and then we'll close with Yvonne sending us into the closure of this night and into the moments that you'll have when you leave this screen. And uh, I just wanna tell you personally what a pleasure it's been to spend some time with you. So thank you. And Andrea and Yonina, take it away. Did we work out who was going to talk first? <laughs> I think we both said, you talk first. So I'll go first. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about um, our ancestors. And so one of my ancestors was Simon Fraser's guide. So he was a Métis interpreter, voyager, and uh, he was Jean-Baptiste Boucher, also known as Wakan. And he brought Simon Fraser here. And I have, of course, mixed feelings about that because we all know what happened after that and he went up to Fort St. James and he ran, helped uh, worked with the HBC up there and Andrea's ancestor they we they knew each other <laughs> yeah so I am related to Simon Fraser who is actually buried across the street from the farm that I'm living at now and so we thought that we would bring this into the space because Changes that are made, community is built in relationship. And so you, Nina, and I are going to um, explore what it means that our ancestors brought us together and, um, you know, working, working out all of our mixed feelings with that. And as a descendant of Simon Fraser, um, I encourage Simon Fraser University to, um, you know, they're they're bringing in these really interesting programs, which I'm so happy to be a part of, and how that they can reflect on their namesake and um, maybe look to the community. And as Yonina's presentation said, like the stories that we tell create our uh, world and perpetuating this story that Simon Fraser found, <laughs> the Fraser River, which was there and was appreciated by many people beforehand. So um, yeah, we extend that invite to Simon Fraser University. Yeah, thank you so much, Yonina and Andrea. I So literally in our class, was we've all been thinking and looking at the family lines that we came from, the chosen lines and the bloodlines, and especially for people who've had a cutoff from their, from their familial heritage and those who have chosen to forget. And this is one of the interesting things around white supremacy is that people of European descent gave up culture, language, and songs. And one of the impacts of that wound and that harm was that it became easier to imagine doing that to other people. And so what we've been unlearning is, um, well, what we've been re-embracing really is, is how to think about the lineages that we've inherited and that we've chosen. And so literally as we've been hailing and calling in our ancestors every week twice a week 
Simon Fraser's translator, interpreter, guide met Simon Fraser's descendant in our classroom. Yes. And the story, um, he's not mentioned in any of the history books. Mine. Nada. Right? No, like, no, it's like he wasn't even there. And for, that's a mixed blessing. <laughs> but yes, thank you. Yeah, so now's the time. And uh, we're just thrilled that you could spend this moment with us as we close out on the miracles of life. Yvonne Rigsby Jones, please take us out or take us in, take us through. Thank you. And on that note, I, I think that what's so interesting is now we can start making, not making, telling different stories about what really happened in our, in our history. And I think it's an exciting time. And my grandchildren watched this program called Oversimplified. And it really talks about what Andrea just said, that there were people here. And that's exactly what they say. Nobody discovered anything. There were people when they got here. And I just love it. I think it's just so fabulous. And so it's just, it's not, it's, it's telling the stories differently. And I think that's an exciting time we're in that we can start doing that and recognizing the other parts of the story. We'll expand them, we'll embellish. I think it's gonna be fun. <clears throat> so, big breath, everyone. Creator, grandmothers and grandfathers, I give thanks for this fabulous evening, for the wonderful energy we've been in, and for each and every one who shared their gifts and their dreams, for all who demonstrated that change is possible, for the respectful participation, all who showed up with great hearts. We ask tonight for all of our families and loved ones to be surrounded in light and love and to be kept safe and strong and healthy, safe from harm. I ask please that at this time we walk gently on earth, that we remember that we're not through this pandemic yet and we, rem we remember still to be cautious, look after each other so as soon we can be back to celebrating like we used to, that we can really be together with freedom on a regular basis again, not be worried about infection, and be back to the world as we once knew it before. And we ask these things, Creator, because we can. And look forward to the rest of our week. And thank each and every one who participated. You rock tonight. Let's have a great rest of the evening. All my relations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I just want to publicly thank you, Yvonne, for just the love and care that you bring to us throughout each class for all of the classes and just your dedication to the learners and the sharing culture with us and helping us um, reimagine our lives as better guests and allies and friends. And I'm hoping you all get a chance to sit with Yvonne Rigsby Jones in our class coming up for cohort three and cohort four. Applications are open. Please join us and you too can sit in the love light of Yvonne Rigsby Jones. And uh, thank you all the learners for joining us. And thank you, Terry. And thank you, Holly and Miki and Seth and Morgan and Janet and Sandy and Sam and Maya. Wonderful that you could all join us. Thank you, Mark Bussy, for coming. Andrea, Paula, Christopher, Luigi, Sobi, I'm so happy you were here. Pedro Tobar, family in the house. Nathan Edelson, thank you for joining us. Michelle LaRay Baker, so happy you could be with us tonight too. Thank you, everybody.